Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to the Book Refuge. Welcome to another weekly wrap up where I talk to you a little more in depth uh, about all the books that I read this week. That was a horribly jumbled way to say that, but I'm not going to refilm it. I'm here to talk to you about the books I read in the last week in depth, okay? That's where we're going with this, including one of my most anticipated books of the last like three years before I even knew its name. Pam Godwin had been dropping hints about this series, trilogy, duet. We didn't know how many it was going to be back then that she was going to drop. Last year when I met her at, uh, uh, North Iowa Book Bash. She was saying that she's working on it and it was a whole nother year before we got it But man, do I have some stuff to say about that book? But first off we have some business to do first off. Have you checked out the book refuge? Etsy shop look at some beautiful book sleeves we have going on right now There's some coffee one for my coffee lovers some bees for springtime um, you can always use the code uh, the book refuge 10 for 10% off of that. So check those out. Um, I'm not really planning to make any new designs until I clean out a little bit of my thing. I have my pot holder gift sets have been knocked down $5 from their normal price. So check those out if you have a gift to get. And, uh, yeah, we have some new patrons who just joined today. We have Gemma. Gemma, thank you so much for supporting me on Patreon. And we have Rachel H. Both of them have joined as paid members of the Patreon. I noticed I have a, a lot of free members joining too, and I love that. You know, you can always follow my Patreon without pledging any money. I do do some posts that are for the public, some behind the scenes stuff, what I'm working on. I do some giveaways there. It's been a little while since I've done one, but I do have a couple birthday gift giveaways that will be coming, and one of them I will only be posting it on my Patreon. So you can follow the link to it. Go ahead and follow. You don't have to pledge any money, but you know, maybe once you see some of the stuff I post, maybe you'll want to, right? Mm -hmm. It's great. All of it keeps the wheels turning here. So let us get into the book. We have the last few books of March, or I mean, we have the last few books of February, which my February wrap up with my favorite books uh, of that month is already up. So you can go ahead and watch that. If I remembered, I'll have clicked the card. So we have the last few books of that month. And then we have my uh, first few of March. So very excited about this because one of my February favorites was actually the last book that I read that month. Oh my gosh, we have some big books to talk about. Holy goodness. Okay, let us get started. So the first one that I finished was a fan fiction. I actually read a good amount of fan fiction in the last couple of days. So this is part of a buddy read I'm doing. I am a part of a fan fiction uh, book club this year and Mel is making us all a copy of whatever fan fiction that we're going to read. So and we also have a different pairing picked for every other month. So we're going to do six of these. So this one is Love and Other Historical Accidents. And if you can't tell, this one is a Dramine. And this one is so cute. This one is a very low spice. It's very much about the banter. If you love Jane Austen, if you love Bridgerton, if you love being, you know, time travel, it's all in this one. Okay. So Hermione and Draco actually work together um, and they end up blowing up one of their experiments, which is of course having to do with the time turner, and they get thrown back in time 200 years. So they have a broken time turner, a missing snuff box, and a handful of overly eligible daughters. So I believe it's the Longbottom daughters. So 200 years ago, there's a lot of names we recognize, like Gaunt is mentioned, and um, I think Gaunt is mentioned, but Longbottom is mentioned, Weasley is mentioned, so a lot of names we still recognize, but specifically we are near the Longbottoms and they have like five daughters or something. And Draco, when they're introduced, wants to say that he's her husband, but Hermione says he's her brother. Do those two look similar to you? I've just, but that's what she goes with. So I think too that subconsciously she's trying to put some distance between them. Um, but uh, then it just makes them look weird when they start being flirty with each other, I'm just saying. But anyway, this is a very slow burn between them. There was, um, at times it got like a little too slow where we're just dragging stuff out. And I don't just mean the romance part of it. This is a slow burn with romance. 
we this is only rated mature which i don't know those of you who are film familiar with ao3 you'll know that there's explicit mature teen but like they're rated that way so that means that there's no explicit sex scenes in here but some of you will like that some of you don't only want to read fan fiction for the smut i don't know who you want no i'm just kidding <laughs> but it was still a great time and this one you can find a podfic on spotify that was done um so if you want to listen to it the narrators for this one are very good i ended up reading most of it myself because i was like why wouldn't i read this beautiful book that mel gave me i wanted to read it here but it did end up being a little bit lackluster for me, but I know that a lot of my friends in the book club just adored it. So this did end up being a three star for me, mostly because like I ended up skimming so much of it because I just wasn't getting what I wanted from it. So that's mostly why I gave it a three. And it was a one and a half on the spice scale and there wasn't really any like trigger warnings or things like that. So still very fun. I will link it down below. You can check it out if you want to. Okay, then I had I had quite a few arcs that I was powering through because I'm very behind on my arcs. You guys have no idea how many books come out this coming week. I'm just, whew, I'm drowning in it, but I'm trying to be good. Um, so I read Castle of Nevers and Nightmares, and this is, I don't want to call it a spinoff. This is a continuation we're going to call it, of the Fae Guardian series. However, you could start with this if you want to, and I'll explain how and why and what I feel. So I'm actually of two minds about this, okay? So I've read all of the Fae Guardians, but the newest one, because I've been waiting for the audiobook. Who knows when we're going to get it, because now she started these other series, and I know audiobooks are expensive, so I understand all of those things. I'm very sympathetic. But that's why, like, I'm just patient to wait for them, because the performances in the first eight of these Fae Guardian books is top tier. The audiobook's wonderful. The first five are actually on any play. So if you have an any play, you have free access to those. They may have even added more. I don't know. I, I, I bought the other ones as they were coming out. So I didn't even know these series were connected. I shared this with my patrons that I was just kind of like, ooh, that looks pretty. And there is this PR company called Nerd Fam that is like focused on dark fantasy, reverse harems, and like, just like darker stuff. And I've been signing up for a bunch of those arcs. And this was the first one I actually like got like right away. And again, I hadn't even looked at all. So once I was approved for the arc, which was only two days before the book came out, like this book is already out, you can go grab it. I'll have a link down below. This cover I just thought was stunning. Like I thought this cover was so stunning. And I just wanted to give it a go. So once I got it, I started looking into the book and I discovered that it was going to be an RH. It was going to be a Y choose. And everyone on this channel, if you've been here before, you know, I'm not a fan of Y choose because in general, I like everyone to be in love with each other. So whether it's two or 10 people, <laughs> I want everyone to love each other. And when you start to add too many bodies into the mix, even if there might be some intermingling of body part, like let's say there is some MMF within the harem, I like everyone to love each other. I know a lot of you feel the same way. So I was nervous about this, okay? I was nervous about it. And we'll get into why I ended up loving this book, okay? I loved it, I gave it five stars. There is a pretty big cliffhanger with this one. I, myself, you know, there was two books that I read in this week that both had like big cliffhangers because they're, well, they're part of like trilogies, not just, you know, not just duets or whatever like they had cliffhangers and this one's one of them but it was so good and I'm not seeing a ton of hype for this like I am for so many so I am gonna really encourage you to read it even if you're someone who like you can handle the cliffhanger you can do it I'm gonna encourage you to read this so continuing on with this I did some more research she had art up of all of them then I started digging in and I heard the heroine's name is Willow which is the daughter of Rush and Clark, or Thorn and Clark, Rush and, uh, Rush and Clark. The first couple, you know, uh, Clark, who has some like gift of premonition, they had a child. And if you've read the Fae Guardian series a little ways on, you know that something happens to Willow. I won't spoil what that is right this second, but something happens with her. And so when I saw this was Willow, I was like, huh, oh, cool. So I was like, it is second generation, but at the same time, I don't actually feel like the Fae Guardian series is done because she hasn't done the year of the crow yet or the season of the crow because 
the first nine books are split into three seasons. Our season of the wolf, season of the vampire, season of the elf or fae or whatever they go by. Um, and they haven't done season of the crow yet. And there's still reference to some of those crows in this book. So I think we will. But anyway, um, the fae like will live a very, very long time. So even though now like Willow is old enough to be having a love story, it's not like her parents are really like that much physically older than they were before or whatever. Um, so anyway, some stuff has happened with Willow. She's a strong fighter now, but something has happened where she no longer has her magic. She used to have, she used to be able to shift into her wolf form. She used to have some of the powers that her parents have and something has happened where she doesn't have that. Now our heroes included in this, and this is where I'll get into why I was okay with this, um, is actually the six. Now, again, if you haven't read the series, the six are also called the Slua and the Slua we don't know a ton about them. So that's the thing. Like we never did know a ton about them in the other series. We only know that there was a time that they betrayed our guardians and we don't know why or what happened. And this story explains why the Slua did betray the, because for a while they had the same job as kind of the fake guardians did like protecting the land. So lots to explain here. I'm sorry. I know some of this might just sound like gobbledygook, but before I go any further, I want to say, why I think this is okay to read if you haven't read The Fake Guardians, and then what my thought is about if you've read it. So again, I've read the first eight of The Fake Guardians, and so I haven't read book nine. And so there's a few things that I learned in this book that I'm like, well, did that happen in book nine? And I just don't know. You know, I felt like I was missing a few things. However, they explained all of them. I just had to wait a little bit. So I was like, are they not like, what did I miss? everything pertinent does get shared to you. It's just, it's purposely being kept from you. So that's why it's okay to read this as the start of it, because anything you need to know for this story, you'll know. We don't know the history of the Slua before this book. So it's not like there's history that you missed. You don't like know fully what led Willow to like where she's at. So you don't need to know beforehand because you find it in this book. So anyway, that's my point of like, you could start with this. If you like RH, I know people are always begging me for RH Rex. Um, I thought this was fantastic and I think it's setting up to be really good. So here's, so then if you have read some of them, I do suggest you read all of them before you start this one. That's where I think there's a divide. I think you shouldn't really do halvesies. That's what I mean. If you've never read Fake Guardians, go ahead and read this and then maybe go back and read the other ones if you want to. If you have read, let's say, five or six of Fig Guardian and you're behind, I suggest you catch all the way up and then do this. Does that make sense? This is just one humble girl's opinion. You do you. You could jump in whenever, right? I'm not here to be like, you're dumb if you do it away. No, 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 no. This is just my opinion because I feel like I felt more confused by having not, you know, read that ninth book. Whereas if I didn't even know that, I think I just would have been great. Okay, the next part of this. I knew I was going to talk a lot about this book. The next part of why this is working as an RH. So now let's get into a bit of the setup of this. But if you're already excited, if you want to know, go ahead and skip ahead because I am going to give some details to tease people into this one and they might feel like spoilers to you. So if you're already hooked, there's a link down below. Go get it. Go read it. Have a great time. I had so much fun. Um, but don't be mad at me when the next one isn't coming until August. I hope she writes it faster, but maybe she'll write it faster if there's more hype for this one than there is for other stuff. So just saying it was great. So we have these six Slua. Now, because of the thing that happened that she lost her magic, there's also a curse that's been put on the Slua, AKA the six. I will actually put up a diagram real quick. Okay. This is a diagram that is in the front of every Fae Guardian book, which explains how the Fae Guardians are. So you see one side of the balance of the Guardians is the year of the wolf, the year of the crow, that. And on the other side is the six, which are the Slua. Okay. And they can be one being or six. Okay. So that's why I'm just saying I really am okay with this as it's going to be an RH because these, these beings are all like so connected, but they aren't right now because of this curse. Okay. Okay. So there's this curse that was put on them. Um, Willow is their fated mate. They knew she was and know that she's their fated mate. And so some of the like drama that went down before where she lost her powers and they were cursed had to do with some maneuvering that they were doing to try to make her be their best mate and they get caught and things go bad and she loses her power and goes home in shame and she 
is at the beginning of this book, she wants nothing more than to kill the six. That is her goal. That's what she wants. But she doesn't have her powers and her family is kind of like coddling her because, you know, they're all super powerful and like she's not. And the six have this curse put on them where they're cursed by this, by this evil queen. We'll just say, we'll just call her evil queen until you get into this, where she tries to erase their memory of tries to erase their memory of Willow so that they forget that they've met their fated mate because she wants to control them. Um, because when they become one, like with their queen, um, like she can control them. Right. And Willow's their true queen, queen, their fated mate, but other Queens have controlled them through time. There's again, this stuff gets explained. I'm just trying to get us why I like this. However, when this curse was set, um, one, like a few of the of the Slua took the full hit of the curse and they were able to protect the mind of one of them. So we have Fox who he is the fifth of the six, which is funny. They, they do have their like pecking order of like, who's kind of there. Um, cause there is, I wrote all their names so I wouldn't forget. Did I put them in order? I don't think I put them in order, but there's Fox, Styx, Legion, Emery's, Varen, and Bowden. So that's the six, that's the Slua. There they are. Okay. And Fox knows what's going on. He knows everything that happened to them and he knows Willow is their mate, but the rest of the six don't. And so they don't, they don't know what's out there for them or what they want. And then to add on top of it, Fox is trying a way to fix it because even when he will like explain it to them again, it's that thing of like, they forget everything and they're slowly like forgetting even more and more stuff. It's they're forgetting their connection with each other. They're not able to make their mind a hive anymore. Um, cause it's called like they're hot. Like they used to have a hive mind. That's something that's talked about a lot in the fake guardian. Like whenever we see a slua, we know that we're not just talking to one, we're talking to six because they have a hive mind. So whatever one hears the another. So this curse has just tore them apart. So I've talked long enough about like, this is all just set up of this book. I know. So I'm going to back up a little bit because I'm getting so excited, but now why I love this so much. So Fox is like the, the, the one we're romancing with in this one, if that makes sense, because he's the one that knows she's our fated mate and he's trying to, and she's like, I hate you guys. You betrayed me. Like, bleh. and he's like, no, like you're meant to be with us. And so not only does he have to convince her, but he's working to convince everyone else. So there is this tournament that um, she ends up getting pulled into. And I won't go into the full details of that, but there's this tournament she gets pulled into and the Slua, they are like the heads of the house of shadow. And she is their like champion. Like she, the, she gets picked for the house of shadows, like the one who's championing them. So that means she's staying in the, this rundown castle that is the home of the Slua and Fox is trying to work his magic to win her over. So why I think this is going to be so good is that in this one, again, the romancing is basically happening with just one of them. There's, you'll, you'll see, I'm not going to spoil it all, but like, so we start with just kind of Fox, but the whole time he's trying to win her over for all of them. Like he's not just trying to win her over for himself because if they're able to break this curse, if they're able to be together, it will be all of them. Okay. So me as someone who doesn't like reverse harem where they're not, whatever, I am super intrigued with how this is going to work and what it's going to look like, you know, how we're going to make them remember, how will we break this curse? Like whew, I'm so into it. So if that isn't enough explaining, I just feel like I went so far down in it. Anyway, I hope you guys skipped ahead of this if you didn't want to spoil it. But I mean, I promise I still didn't spoil like a lot of shit in this, but I did talk a lot. So anyway, Castle is never a nightmare. Go grab it if you love fantasy. If you love RH, even if you don't love RH, but you love fantasy and you're like willing to give a try, I think you should with this one because it's also like easing you into it. Like it's not just like, bam, all six men at once <laughs> happening. Okay, it's not happening. So I gave this five stars. I enjoyed myself immensely or no, I gave it, I guess I did give it 4.5 stars because of said confusion that I had. Uh, but it may move up to a five star when I read the other books because that could happen if I see how well it ends. It does only have a two on the spice scale because again, we are moving up to it. Okay, let's move along. The next one is The Only One by Daisy Jane. Okay, so I ended up wanting to continue this series because I read book two 
last month or in January and then I read book one I listened to an audio arc of that one and I really wanted to read book three which this one is a submissive man soft dom woman they are double virgins it is the um, receptionist at the um, wrench kings and then one of the mechanics and he like grew up in almost like a cult or whatever so he's very like He's not submissive because of that, but he is very shy and like he's very sweet. And Delane, the woman, um, she is like, I will help you become more confident if you help me with my mechanic skills because she wants to become a mechanic. So yeah, so it's a sex deal kind of thing. So she starts teaching him things about sex, teaching him to be more confident. Meanwhile, like they're both pining so hard for each other they think they'll only have a limited time with each other but they're both pining so hard so super sweet um very kinky because yeah there was butt plugs and there was male chastity used in this one which is great there was a, a cock cage in here and yeah there it's a very soft like she's never like there's not humiliation or like demeaning stuff with it it's all very hot so if you know, if you don't know if you want like submissive man or you're not sure, this would be a great one to start with because it is very soft. It's really only, he feels most comfortable when they're having sex if she's leading it because he doesn't know what to do. And then by the time he does know what to do, he just likes her telling him what to do, right? So there's that. So you decide if that'll work, but I gave this a four and it was a four on the spice scale. Okay. And then the last book I read in February was one of my favorites. I read Small Town Swoon by Melanie Harlow. This book will be out on Monday. Is it out on Monday? It's Monday or Tuesday. One of one of those. Um, and this is the fourth book in the Cherry Tree Harbor series. This is about Dashiell Buckley or Dash who is an actor. Um, he was on a show that was kind of like Baywatch and he's trying to become a serious actor. He's having a lot of trouble getting that role because people just want to um, kind of put him in his like where he's supposed to sit. So he goes to stay at home in Cherry Tree Harbor for a month because his brother's going to get married and he also you know, is trying to like find himself and find his soft side. So he goes back there. Now Ari, her family owns the diner in town and she has these plans to, you know, she wants to kind of like upscale the diner a little bit. And her parents are mostly her mom are just like, no, we've got to keep it comfortable. We've got to keep it normal for everything. But they're a little experiment she's like trying to do with um, the type of like food she makes and just trying to inch her parents into that stuff and everything. But anyway, Ari has kind of had a little bit of a grudge against Dash for a while because she made a move on him when she was 16 and he was, I think, like 20 or something because I think he's like three or four years older than her and he had to turn her down, which, shocker, she was 16 and it was at, she was sleeping over with her friend, which is his younger sister, and his dad was home. Like, he wasn't gonna do that. But she's held this, like, tiny little grudge. It's not an enemies to lovers by any means, but it's definitely a friends to lovers. But she's just always been a little, her pride's been a little bit hurt. But they get over that real quickly. Dash is just so kind. I, I'm sorry. Like, yes, he's hot. He's sweet. He's he's funny but like he's so kind and I was immediately swept up and like there's a situation where Ari needs some help with her diner and he's kind of like you know I've washed dishes and bus tables and done all that stuff in Hollywood before I made it like I will absolutely help you and so he steps up to help her and also just like encourages her in her dream and she helps him reach his deeper side by playing lots of romance films for him. So yeah, and then they become a friends with benefits. So this is like, yeah, brother's best or best friend's brother and uh, friends with benefits. And then, yeah, he has to decide, you know, does he want his career or Ari or can he still have both? Like that kind of thing. But this was so sweet. I didn't have anything I disliked about it. You know, there's it's just done very, very well. So I gave this five star and it was a three on the spice scale. They had some fun stuff and they watch a lot of some of our favorite movies. So it was delightful. Okay. Now we have the March books. So here we go. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of go quickly through 
a couple of these because like I said, I have the Pam Godwin to talk about and I have a lot to say about it. So I read Dark Delights by Mila Kane. This one comes out next week, I think on Friday. This is book two in the Hellions of Hade Harbor. Um, this one is uh, Beckett and Eve. And this is a like rich boy, poor girl type scenario. And she is actually the daughter of the cleaner for his family. And he has a evil stepmother. Like there's no other way to say it. She's been the daughter of the cleaner since they were both 13. They went to the same high school and now they've ended up at the same college too. Um, and he is being like, I'm just going to tell you, this is a trigger warning. Here we go. He was being molested. He has been molested by his stepmother and some of her friends even. And it isn't happening all the time, but it's made it like impossible for him to want to be around home. And he has been doing like a lot of drugs to deal with it, which I don't love when characters are doing drugs. I don't love that. But it doesn't last long in this book. And it is to show that he is self-medicating. He's trying to make himself be numb. And the real reason this one turns into a bully romance is they've never gotten along because she always sees these like sensitive moments in his life and so he just he pushes all this hate on her but what really flips it over is that she accidentally stumbles across his drug stash when she's cleaning and she her mom like catches her with it and I mean her mom doesn't think that it's hers at all but is like where'd you get this and so she admits it and then the mom gives it to her employer which is the dad and he brings the hammer down hard on Beckett which of course his evil stepmother is just whispering in her husband's ear immediately about how um he is gonna spiral out of control and just like all this awful awful stuff so he of course figures out that um that it was Eve who turn this in and he blames it. So, cause he has to go cold Turkey and his dad is like, if I, I'm going to be regularly drug testing you. And if I find it, you're going to lose hockey because I'm going to tell your coach and you're going to lose it. Um, I honestly like this dad makes a lot of mistakes in this book, but for me personally, I love that he does that move because I just don't like seeing characters do those types of recreational drugs. I've said it before and I know a lot of you agree with me, but moving on. So now they end up at the same college. To make it another level up, she has a twin brother who is actually f part of the Hellions, okay? So this is a whole nother level to it. But he's going to another college right now because that's where he got a scholarship to and her family's really poor, of course. And so his room was supposed to be the one that got canceled because they were both going to go to the same college but he got this other offer for somewhere else and her room is the one that got canceled and there's no other ones left. So she ends up taking her brother's room because they have the same last name. And so she's just like, I'm the one who's supposed to be in this room. But of course his dorm is in the hockey, the sports one and his roommate is Beckett. So uh, uh, pretty unbelievable how this is going to play out, like how we get them in the same place. But she's like, I'm going here and I'm going to be here. And so they're sharing a room, literally. They're sharing a dorm room. So yeah, that is where their bully scenario will go from. So this one was pretty intense, but honestly, this one had such an emotional um, journey for Beckett. And I like, honestly, he did some shit that I was just like, are you kidding me? That in some bully ram romances, you're just like, God, you can't come back from this, you little shit. But, like, they help each other so much. And so, yeah, I did give this one four stars, though, because, I mean, I liked the first one more. And because of those frustrations, this one was just kind of eh for me. But I gave it four. It's a four and a half on the spice scale. It is hot, hot, hot. We have bondage, CNC, orgasm control, public sex, spanking. Then trigger warnings, there's stalking. Some by the hero, but in this one, it's not all the hero. And then there is incest, not the main couple. No, 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 but somewhere else. And of course, molestation and assault of a underage person. So... Okay, then we had 
two fan fictions, which I'm barely going to touch because they were just so, so. So I read Disdain Me Still by Siren Gray, and this one was a Lumine. That is where Lucius actually gets a job as the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher, and Hermione's the potions professor. And she, of course, is like super angry that he was hired for it and just like, oh, this ex-Death Eater, like I just hate it. But then she actually overhears a conversation where Lucius is like begging Draco to let him meet his grandchild. And he's like, I'm trying to do everything I can to prove that I've changed, to prove that I'm better. And Draco's wife is just not like interested, doesn't want their kid around him. And he like breaks down crying and Hermione witnesses it. So he gets pretty pissed. So it almost turns into like a bully situation. It doesn't, but like he's so upset that she shot him in this moment. And she's just like, it starts to change her feelings towards him. That he is genuinely trying to change because he wants to be a part of his son and his grandchild's life. And yeah, but this one was pretty quick. It's only like 150 pages, um, like 4,200 words or 42,000 words. It was pretty quick. And this one didn't really have any kinks in it at all. So I gave this one four. It was a two and a half on the spice scale. And it was just sweet, quick. It was a fun. And then I read Piblocto. Piblocto. I don't know how to say that. I don't know if it's a different language or like what it is. But it's by Ian the Waiting, which I have read other fix by them. And this one fulfilled something that I've been trying to find for ages now. Okay. <clears throat> so those of you who are my fanfic friends, you know that I have this like just little bingo card going just for me where I want to read Hermione with every Weasley. And the ones I was having the most trouble finding is her with George. I need to check um, fanfic.net. I haven't checked there yet. And I want to find her with Ron. Like I per just for this, I know, I know that one isn't necessarily fan fiction, but I just wanted to read one, okay? It didn't have to be long, but I wanted to find one. So I ended up finding a Hermione and Ron, but it's a Hermione, Ron, and Harry. And I made this joke with Jess and I was like, even when she's paired with Ron, it can't just be Ron. We got to add something else in, which is totally fine. Like I am, I love the books that Ron bash, okay? I'm, again, I just wanted to find one where they, they genuinely have like an HEA that's in one. So this one is actually kind of a dystopian book. There's a nuclear winter after the like Wizarding War. And so basically like Ron, Hermione, and Harry don't get to like go home after like stuff in book seven. So they are living out of the tent and like traveling and sometimes they run into some of the other survivors. But Ron, Hermione, and Harry have kind of just all like they're all just bisexual and into it. So <laughs> there are some scenes where they share comfort with each other and yeah, and it ends with them all having like officially come to the agreement that they're not just doing this for the time that they're surviving. Like they actually want it to be like a relationship, a throuple type of thing. But there are scenes with just Harry and Ron and then there's scenes with all of them and there's a couple with Ron and Hermione and they're just all like, it was fun. Oh, well, fun's the wrong word. <laughs> it was fun to finally read a Ron and Hermione one, but it was good. And in this one, Ron is actually very like studly in here. Okay. Like I know it's hard to believe, but his description in this one is he's actually like really built. He's more like built like a football player type. Um, and a lot of that is just like hard work and he's older too, right? Like he's not teenage scrawny Ron. Like they've been surviving for years and that like, you know, he's, built up just through life. So it was okay though. Like I didn't like love the story parts of this it was kind of confusing, even though I love the idea of dystopian one, like give it to me. I love the idea of survival ones. Um, I've read a few and I still haven't found the kind of survival one that I really want, but it was all right. So purely, purely guys read this for my challenge. I'm not going to be reading Ron and Hermione fic all the time, but and no, that is I don't need to read fan fiction if that's the pairing that I want. So I gave this one three. It's three on the spice scale. And I mean, yeah, there's some MMF scenes. Okay. Now, um, Moonlit Thorns by P. Rain. I will say, not the best pseudonym that they picked. So this is Piper Rain. This is an author duet. Um, and their fantasy for like, they're really dark. Because they have contemporary and then they have like dark. And doing P. Rain not the most uh, best choice for <laughs> their like pseudonym. I'm just saying, I'm just saying like P 
rain, whatever. So anyway, this was one that um, there's a PR company that ha usually has audiobooks available. So I've been checking them more often. They're the same one that I got um, like the Daisy Jane ones from. They have audio codes. If I remember, I'll link them down below, but I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head. But Moonlit Thorns is the start of a new series called, um, is it Midnight Manor? Is Midnight Manor the series? Yeah, Midnight Manor. And they're going to be uh, fairy tale retellings with dark billionaire romance, okay? So this one is, of course, what do we start with? Beauty and the Beast, like we always do, right? It's okay, it's okay. So we have Annabelle, who her father died owing $3 million to the Voss family, which there is four brothers. Um, and her father was also found dead on their property. And they don't know why or like what really happened but he was found dead on their property but also he died owing them a lot of money and they are going to repossess their home and so she goes to beg asher voss to change his mind and so she goes there to beg and he's like no 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 you're losing it you're losing it. and she's like isn't there anything you let me do and so he's like okay really he just wants to scare this little bitch away right that's what he's thinking so he's like okay we're gonna make a deal I will forgive the debt if you work for me for one year. And while you live here, you won't have a phone. You're going to be a servant here. You'll do whatever that I ask you to do. And after 365 days of working for me, the debt will be cleared. Which, if you think about it, to pay her, basically give her $3 million for a year of work, I mean, sign me up. I would do that. So it starts out where she's put in kind of the lowliest of positions in this place, um, where she's you know, having to make his breakfast and like clean rooms. And of course it's don't go in any of the wings that belong to my brothers and stay out of my private spaces, only work in like these areas and stuff. And so there's lots of him being very beastly. So what I'll say about this one too, is that, you know, if you love the Disney movie, this has all the beats of it. Okay. In a sexy BDSM billionaire version, there is, you know, the, someone named Philip, there is Mr. and Mrs. Potter. There is a Maurice. Like all of these names are like the household staff and people and everything. And there is a sex club involved and there is a stalker happening. But in a lot of aspects, this just fits in with a lot of like billionaire kinky romances you might have read. It was perfectly serviceable. It read really easily. The audio performance is by... Rose, Rose Diorio and Marcio Catalano, which I think I've heard Rose Diorio before, but I don't know if I've heard the man before, but it was very good. It was duet narration and it is available right now. So you can go listen to that on Audible if you would like to. Um, as I said, this one, there's age gap, enemies to lovers, forced proximity, beauty and the beast retelling. There's a sex club involved. There's BDSM in this. And yeah, it was good. There is bondage, impact play, orgasm control, stuff in a sex club. There are trigger warnings for mention of suicide, death of parent, murder, and there is an attempted rape at one point, not the hero. So I saved the longest for last. So I'm going to talk about Hills of Shivers and Shadows now. So how am I going to talk about this? So this comes out March 12th and Okay, how do I, in my head, I had how I wanted to talk about this book. So this is the first in a trilogy. The next two books should, will be out by June is what Pam said. So honestly, like it's up to you, like if you want to wait till they're all out. But since I won't have to wait a ton of time, well, and I read an arc, so I'm going to keep reading these as they come out. But this had a cliffhanger that left my heart thumping so hard. So first one I'm going to say. And of course, I'm going to go into heavy detail because that's what I do um, and I'll get into things. But first thing I want to say is that if you love Pam Godwin and you know you're going to read this no matter what, okay, like not the people who are hesitant. If you love Pam Godwin or Dark Romance and you know you're going to read this no matter what, I highly, highly recommend that you just read it. I know people say, again, I will give you details because like, I know that people say that to me. I'm like, <laughs> no, I want to know. So I'm going to tell you because that's my job. I will. But I just want to put that out there that I highly recommend you just read it. 
you know, I'll tell even some of the basic stuff and I'll give other chances to back out of this if you want. But I highly recommend if you're sure you're going to read it anyway, and no matter like how I talk about it, you want it. I highly recommend you do because the ride that this book is, is totally amazing if you don't know what's going on. Okay. Then the next level of this is in the book, Pam has two levels of trigger warnings. Okay. And you'll see this when you get your copy of it. She has a link to her website with a list of trigger warnings that are like non-spoiler ones. Okay. And then she has another link that says, if there are certain triggers, you know, you have, and like by seeing them, you just cannot read this book. Here is another level. But she even says, she's like, you know, if you read dark romance, like then don't read these triggers because you should just read it. Okay. So that's what you'll see from Pam. And I honestly like, feel the same way after reading it because I'm a nosy bitch. As I said, that's why I give so many details because I'm a nosy bitch. Like I did look at them, but see for me, when I see trigger warnings, I usually immediately forget them. I know, I know. But as soon as I'm diving into the book, I forget about the trigger warnings until I get to the part where it happens. And I'm like, oh yeah, she warned me about this, but I'm very like able to do that. And so things that won't be a surprise if you see the trigger warnings, like I knew they're coming. I only have two trigger warnings that will throw me out if I don't know. And as most of you know, that is miscarriage or loss of a baby in any way as well and harm to animals. Okay. So those are ones I have to know. So I did go and look at them and I will tell you both of those things happen in this book. <laughs> So those were the two that I was really eyeing for, but I did see what all the trigger warnings are. And if you, if you're nosy, if you need to know, do it. But I don't mean this in the kindness any way or in a gatekeeping thing. I just think if you are excited to read this, no matter what, I highly recommend you just dive in. Okay. So this is the next like jump off point, jump off. If you're going to read it, get the link, go pre-order it and be ready to go. Okay. This one won't be on Kindle Unlimited. So you, if you pre-order it, you'll be able to get it at 11 PM the night it comes out or the night before it comes out. Um, but the, her books aren't on Kindle Unlimited because she does all of her own stuff. She doesn't partner with Amazon or any of that. So you will have to like buy this one. So now the next level of it, let me give you kind of the basic over reach of this story. Okay. So this begins with a kidnapping. Um, the story set up. Okay. And like I said, I'll give you the next jumping off point. If you'll want to leave before I go to like the next level of explaining it. Okay. Um, but, oh, but before you go, I'm giving this a five star spice scale. You'll see when you read it, it's very hard to rate this one on spice scale because some of the sex things that are happening are like, I wouldn't consider them like spice. So anyway, um, I did give it a four for like spice, but yeah, anyway, <laughs> I did give this one a five, but I think that once I've read this whole thing, I'll give the trilogy a six star, but I'm giving it a five for now because like it's a cliffhanger. It's not a complete story. This is literally that. Okay. So, um, the setup of this, we have Frankie who she lives in Sitka, Alaska. She has a billionaire as a husband. She's a trauma nurse and they live on like a little island. Like literally they have to take a boat to and from to like get home or not. And they have a fight because she's just found out she's pregnant and Monty, her husband, they were never going to have kids. Um, and he's supposed to have had a vasectomy. And so she got pregnant and now he wants her to get rid of it. And she's like, hell no. So they have this huge fight and she, um, is like, well, I'm going to leave him. She doesn't like fully say that to him, but she's like, I'm not doing this. So he's like, well, I'll be home early and then we can talk about it. But she's like pissed. So she packs her bags and he doesn't come home early. So she's like, well, I'm going to leave then because I'm not going to get rid of this child. And fuck him if he doesn't want to do it. But before she can fully make her decision, she gets attacked by a man named Denver, who we know is stalking her from the prologue. Like in the prologue is from Denver's point of view. And we know that he's waiting for her to be alone so that he can take her. So the setup begins with a kidnapping is the start of this. Honestly, as, as many a Pam Godwin has before and many a dark romance has before is she's kidnapped 
and she's drugged and she is first carried in a boat and then she's on a plane and when the plane lands she is at this remote like I don't even want to call it a farm but a remote home and Denver has three grown sons and they all live at the hills of shivers and shadows aka Haas so the homestead is called Haas so that's where this name comes from so we're going to be calling it that and she doesn't know why she's been taken Denver doesn't explain why she's been taken but there is immediately great animosity from two of the sons so let me tell you who people are and then I'm gonna give another jumping off point, okay? So we so again there's Denver, the man who kidnaps her, and then there is the um sons. One is 30, his name is Leo. There is Kodiak, who is I think 25, and there is Wolfson, who is um 23. So there's these three sons. Denver, I think, is 48, is what he says. So he's kidnapped her, and she's going to be there. And we ha are here. We don't know why we're here or what's going to happen, but there's immediately animosity from the two oldest boys. They are like, you're going to cause problems. You're going to hurt people here. We don't want you here. And just all these things are being spewed at her. And she's like, well, I don't want to be here. Like, take me home. And Denver's like, not going to happen. Um... So yeah, so she's on this remote location with four men, um, two of which seem to really hate her. The youngest son seems a little bit loopy. Like I'm saying that with love for Wolfson, but he's a little bit like crazy from the isolation, we'll just say, or disturbed, whichever term we want to use, you'll see. Um, and Denver is just this smug, disturbing man, we'll just say. Okay, so I'm going to put this as your next jumping off point because now I'm going to explain a bit more for a next level. So now we are at like the final breakaway for spoilers. Okay, and again, I'm not even going to, I won't go into like too much of this, but I'm going to tell you now like what the very heavy trigger warnings are, which again, Pam has them all provided on her website. You can do that. But if you're going to read this anyway, or you're intrigued by how I've set it up, I highly suggest you be done and we'll see you in the next video, okay? Because you may want to experience this yourself, okay? Okay, so Frank doesn't want to be here and we, you know, in the beginning of this see, she tries to get out of these men, like why she's there. And of course, Denver, he doesn't help at all. Um, but she tries to get it out of the boys who, again, the two older ones, Leo and Kodiak really don't want her to be here. And she's like, I don't want to be here either. But what we find out about this location is that they are in the Arctic circle. The only way in and out is the plane that only Denver has the keys to. It gets locked up when he's not in it. Um, the dashboard is covered so they can't see the display or how it works. They um, completely rely on him flying out and giving them food and supplies. And if he were to never come back, they would starve to death very quickly through the, well, not very quickly, but they would starve to death. And so Frankie isn't the only one who's, has been, or is being held captive in this place. Okay. So the very heavy trigger warnings the ones that is the spoiler. Again, I hope you're listening to me if you don't want to know this. The one that's a spoiler is Celia. Because these men were once boys here and Denver made them be there. And we also learned there has been other women who've been there, but I won't tell you all their stories, but there have been, she is not the first woman who's been brought there and there is very specific reasons why Kodiak and Leo are trying to push her away so hard and don't want to give a fuck about her and are very much keeping her at arm's length. And then there's just Denver walking around, watching, waiting for the devil's bargain, which once you find out what the devil's bargain is, 
I'm not going to tell you what it is. So, <laughs> um, so though that is what the big trigger warning is, in my opinion. It's the one that I think a lot of people are not going to be able to read this for. Um, and it's the one that I think when I say it out of context of the story, people are like, oh man, what's Pam doing? Where's she going with it? But, you know, I've said many, many, many times, and it feels so good to have a new book to say it about, but Pam has taken me dark places in books that I never thought I would like willingly read those stories. And she's made me care about those characters so much. And she's done it already with characters in this book. So also some things I want to put out there because I was confused when I was reading this, okay? Because there are three sons and Denver. And before like I have any idea about what that a big trigger warning was, as I said, I was like, there was people calling this a why choose. I want to put that out there. People calling this a why choose story. And since the beginning, since Pam started, she said this was going to be an MMF that took place in Alaska. And she's been saying that for years. So when I saw some people like, you know, because she, she puts a lot of trigger warnings on her website and or like content warnings. And some of them only apply to very few situations. Let me put it that way. But I want to like encourage those of you who don't like why choose, which again, I did a whole rant about that earlier in this video. Um, this series will be MMF. Don't want to spoil for how this book plays out or what's going on and all of the things happening, but the relationship, what will be an HEA will be an MMF. And she says that in, um, actually in this book too, that books one and two have a cliffhanger and book three has a poly, um, happily ever after. And her Polly is MMF. Okay. So that's what it's going to be. So, but I understand now after reading it, why people who are reviewing it and people who are thinking it are calling this one, why choose? Cause it kind of is, you'll see. So anyway, if I haven't scared you away yet, I hope you've pre-ordered this book. Um, once it's out, I can't wait to talk about people with this. Um, but I also think, so I'm making this video go long, but it's been a while since we had a really long one. So this is a like non-spoiler part now. So if some people are listening to this part, I'm not going to talk about the spoilers anymore for it. But I think it will be very interesting to see what the reaction to this book is. Because I think there's some people who in reading like TikTok bad books, or that's the wrong word, but like TikTok taboo books or TikTok dark romance or what's popular, they think they've read the darkest shit there is. And it's been four years since Pam Godwin's put a book out. Or they've read Sea of Ruin. Or they've read Dark Notes. Which both have taboo elements. Both have dark things. But like they ain't got a like. They can't hold a candle to her Deliver series. or And not be of content. I love Sea of Ruin. It's one of my favorite books. I mean the darkness content. You know like people if they think Sea of Ruin is dark. Or they think Dark Notes is dark. Like. You haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. Okay. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to scare people, but I am trying to like, I'm serious. I enjoyed this so much. It has aspects of thriller and horror and I don't like those things, but Pam does. And she's an author that the, the bad things in here, this is not torture porn. It is not. I will fight anyone who says it is because there are some horrible things we witness through the eyes of our characters in this book. But she also doesn't like rub our nose in it. She doesn't linger on it. It's like we know that it's happening and then we're like, well, how are we dealing with it? Um, and that's something she did in the Deliver series a lot. Even when we're like literally there's torture scenes and there's rape scenes in there. They serve a purpose. And I think that not everyone will agree. Not everyone will see it that way. But, you know, as someone who's been reading Dark Romance for six, seven years now, there's no one that comes at it quite the way that Pam does. And honestly, there's no ones that I would trust the same way. Because again, I've read some of the books people say are dark. And there's very few authors that actually do it the way that she does. And that's not to throw those out. Like, I love Rena Kent. Rena Kent wouldn't tell a story like this. Her dark is like, her version of dark is like the dove con or like the forcing into something. Like, this is like psychological darkness. Um, 
and I would only trust Pam to do this. Like things I would never read like in a regular horror because there's no guarantee my characters have an HEA. Where I ended this book on a cliffhanger, no happily ever after in sight, but I know it's coming. And I know that it's gonna feel triumphant and glorious and, and I'm probably gonna have a new favorite thruple that I've ever read because I trust the journey she's gonna take me on. Um, and not everyone is in that same place with Pam or in that same place with dark romance. So a lot of dark romance feels cheesy or gimmicky to me. And I enjoy some of those sometimes when they are right. Like I have some mafia ones. They are completely gimmicky and I still have a blast, but this isn't the type of story like you're going to have a blast with like, and when I say I enjoyed it so much, I enjoy Pam's talent so much. I did not enjoy the story aspects. Like I was my skin was crawling and I had to read this in over four days because I would re I was like, I can't have this be the last thing I read before I went to bed. Like I switched, I switched to a shark alien romance. I switched to a Lumine fan fiction before I went to sleep because I couldn't have this be the last thing I read before I went to bed. But I'm okay with that. I have very few triggers and the triggers I do, Pam puts them in all her books but it's still worth it. And she has a quote at the beginning of this book that, I mean, some people might think she's being, you know, but it's like, you don't grow where you're comfortable. And I mean, you're not going to be comfortable, but it's going to give us a lot to talk about. So anyway, I hope that you'll give that a try. I hope you'll give a bunch of these books a try. Um, it felt good to go for almost an hour again. It's been a while since I've done that. Thank you so much to the new patrons who are supporting me. Thank you to those of you who I know are going to check out the Book Refuge Etsy shop and find something. Shout out to Mel for making me this beautiful book. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.